issue is so complicated and deep-rooted, it won't go away soon. What I hope to get out of it is a better sense of what the main issues are and what a knowledge platform like Beam can do to take things forward. So I would really ask you in your questions to also think about what next. What can the speakers do? What can Beam do? What can you do? And we'll have a poll looking at next steps at the end, so an extra incentive to wait right to the end. So now I would like to hand you over to Rabaev. Rabaev, does the poll surprise you at all? What people are thinking around the world, and I think this um, webinar is very context specific as well. So, thank you, Ashley. If I may start, um, a very warm welcome to everyone joining from around the world, and very good to see a lot of known faces. So, um, I, can, I can see the faces right in front of my laptop, otherwise, I was just looking at the laptop, which is not very appealing. So, um, so uh, I begin. Next slide, please. Um, so, as I begin with this very complex topic that Ashley mentioned about, um, I wanted to reflect on some encounters and conversations that I've had, uh, not very lately. Um, I, I called a private sector um, person in Bangladesh because I was designing a, a big project, and I called him to find his time to talk about his experiences, and he was like, oh, you just got a bit late. Um, I, I have another appointment. Where are you going? To this conference on private sector engagement for climate change. Voila. Very good. So I do have an appointment. Um, next slide, please. And then um, I had some conversations, which are ongoing conversations with many of you who have joined here. One of those went like, um, it was an email from an esteemed colleague, and he was like, look, um, I know that the team leader and the project staff were very com competent, and, but the country had almost a disease of too many years of too many handing out supply-driven projects. And he was saying, like, it is an uphill task to do a pure M4P in the setting that he was talking about. And also lately, I met a lead evaluator of a very big project, and um, he was talking to me and was asking me, so gentlemen, why do you think this project is replicating its interventions rather than investing on consolidating towards a system change? So these questions led me to think deeply about what's going on. First and foremost, the fact that the private sector is establishing business coordination units, which are basically chasing donor fund. Is this some kind of a distortion? How does it affect our vision for systems change? And nextly, um, when we are talking about um, the context of M4P in situations where you have a lot of donors with a lot of different approaches competing with each other. Does M4P or market-driven approach deliver? If not, what do we do? Next slide, please. So these are the reflections that I've had. So I wanted to answer this question. Next slide, please. And I began with asking myself why this happened and what can we do about it? To analyze this concept, next slide, please. I first wanted to find out how the context of uh, aid intensive context look like. So I figured there are two kind of contexts. Um, firstly, what we have is a facilitation only approach competing with hands out approach. What we mean here is that a project which is adopting a light touch facilitation approach of M4P uh, which does not really give out a lot of subsidy, free discount, and et cetera, is competing with a project which is providing direct services to reach out to the target beneficiaries. On the other stream, we also have market development projects competing with each other. And this happens when, in a similar market system, two different types of projects, which are also adopting market development approach, is competing with each other to address the same challenge. Um, and um, so that also leads to competition between these donor funded projects uh, where you have two projects trying to address similar change in a similar market system. So if these are the two contexts, how it affects the capacity of program managers to deliver? Next slide, please. To answer that question, I first try to look at the framework of how we want to do market systems change. Of course, the people who have joined here, we are all seasoned practitioners and we all do it, but nevertheless, I wanted to have a reflection on how we do it. What we present here is that we start with the positioning of our project and bear in mind that positioning does not happen directly by the program managers. It starts with the 
donors who first define what kind of a challenge they would like to address in what kind of a market system and context and what kind of an approach would work, which then leads to commissioning of the project and the project is starting with an inception defining what should be done and how. That leads to partnership between the project and private actors. This is still very much project driven, but soon enough, we start a pilot where instead of the project taking the lead, we start a joint effort between the project and the partner. And that eventually leads to the partner, we hope, which will be scaling up to go deeper to reach more people, which we couldn't reach through the project intervention. As the project support fades, we believe that the market system will take up the innovation to go to deeper markets, to go to newer territories, thereby sustaining the systems change. Next slide, please. And then I try to look at, okay, if those two kinds of contexts are there, how it affects the possibility for systems change? I see the effect on two areas, on scale up potential and on systems change. Here on the screen, I'm presenting to you a few of the, uh, I mean, dysfunctions I would rather say that I have encountered. On the scale up area, what we see is that instead of the scale up initiatives being driven by the private sector, it, it very much remains to be driven by the donor and the projects. And on the systems change side, what we have is that the private sector, instead of taking it up on their own, they wait for donor funding to be available. If not, they would not do it. And also what we see is that a lot of other private actors we not reached out by the project are not crowding in. If crowding in is not taking place, if other system players are not crowding in to respond to the initiative, then we are not having a systems change that is trickling down to reach increasing number of poor people. Next slide, please. So why, why that happens? So I tried to use that pathway of market facilitation framework to find out the dysfunctions that probably is leading to that. On the positioning side, I see a lot of donors crowding in and chasing the same success. If that project was successful, why can't we do the same? On the other side, we have um, also different, pro different donors, a lot of projects trying to address the same market systems challenge. And what we have essentially is a lack of synergy between the projects. On the partnership side, the focus solely rests on private sectors, but market systems also involve not for profit actors and public sector actors. And in context of Bangladesh, the NGOs are very much prominent. And if you're taking health systems uh, markets, as, I mean, if I, for instance, the NGOs are very much prominent. So you cannot really have just private actors being as your partners. On the pilot, we have very limited time frame, And often I see market development practitioners complaining that we did not have enough time to do the innovation. So rather, we will go for the quick fix interventions that will deliver the large outreach that we are talking about or that the donor is interested about. Next slide, please. So how to address these dysfunctions? Um, look at the first context where we are competing, the facilitation approach is competing with direct support interventions. On the coping strategy, what I propose is that we should have a more holistic view of market systems. In context, for example, in health systems or wash sectors where we are trying to adopt a market systems approach, by adopting a holistic view of market systems, we, 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 we might have the potential to work not only with private sector, but also with public actors and not-for-profit actors uh, with respect to the context that we are dealing with. Here the question is, what happens after the project support is withdrawn? It's not about how the private sector is responding, it's about how the market systems is responding. So that might reduce the tension between facilitation and handout approach and improve synergy between donor mandates. Um, I also propose that uh, the mandate for the project should be expanded beyond five years that gives more scope for this kind of a project to trial uh, a mix of facilitation and also in some context, a handout approach that they can start with. This is very much applicable for projects which are targeting ultra poor and might start with very much livelihood kind of interventions and then eventually want to graduate to market driven interventions. And finally, there are donor coordination groups, but these groups are most systematic, like in case of Market Development Forum in Bangladesh, it has members which are working on market development. How about expanding the capacity of these groups to also involve projects that are not working only on market development. Next slide, please. Finally, on facilitation versus facilitation interventions, I propose two kind of strategies. Number one is very much uh, interesting. Um, 
in market systems change, we are talking about systems change, but eventually all the projects report big numbers. Now, chasing after big numbers, often the projects, due to the short time span, as I said, chase after the quick solutions and often forget to address the deeper systems change challenges. So if we, in addition to numbers, also incentivize the systems change indicators and the performance of the project accordingly, that would probably incentivize the project managers to, 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 to adopt interventions that are more systemic and longer term in nature. And also, um, I was talking about the donor coordination groups, probably we need to expand their capacity or strengthen their capacity to also advocate for uh, reducing overlaps, competition, and signs of distortions um, between the donors. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rabaith. That's a really, really great to hear that. Uh, so Rabaith has shared the problem, and I was particularly struck and kind of say alarmed by businesses creating these donor relation units. Uh, and also he shared some ways forward he has seen in, clearly in working with multiple projects. So Natalie will now take us forward with the tactics that Helvetas are using in the Balkans. I think you will all really, really like this. A lot of thought has clearly gone into the different tactics you can use and their relevance in different contexts. Indeed, it feels like the Balkans in some respects here has been a fertile testing ground for these ideas. And I'm sure you all, all will take some useful lessons out of it. So Natalie, if I can pass to you. Thank you very much, Ashley. Yes, yeah, so I'm basically going to talk about Helvetas' experience in implementing youth employment projects here in the Western Balkans. Now, our context is slightly different from what Rubaias has already described. So next slide, please. So we actually implement youth, pro, um, youth employment programs in Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Albania. And our starting point is really to use an MSC approach. So we see ourselves as facilitators. We work through our partners uh, to bring about systemic change with the ultimate end goal of sustainability, which means the continuation of impact beyond the project's intervention and ensuring that the ownership of the improved systems lie with actors in the market system. Next, while um, we are also operating in a fairly donor crowded environment, it's slightly different from what Rubaya has described. So in our case, we are the old ones out. So for instance, um, in Albania, VC Albania is the only MC project. Similarly, Market Makers is the only one in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in addition to I in Kosovo, there's just one more project applying an MSD approach. And we found that our working methodology often collides with the prevailing donor culture of providing direct assistance, which sometimes needs little consideration for market distortion and can in fact increase donor dependency in many cases. So here are some of the examples that we have experienced here in the Western Balkans, and I'm sure that many of you um, who are tuning into this can relate to them. So for instance, the I project in Kosovo works in the traditional uh, sweet production sector, which includes confectionery such as baklava. And it found that one of the major constraints preventing the growth of the sector was the lack of food safety certification, which sort of limits the sector's export potential. But as a fairly promising sector, there were a lot of donors who were keen to get involved in the sector. And most of them actually focused on direct assistance, so buying, basically providing funds to buy equipment. But um, I's market analysis actually showed that financing really wasn't one of the major constraints in the sector, as most companies were able to get loans from banks. So by having multiple donors uh, providing direct assistance to these companies, this hugely distorted the market and also made it less likely for sweet production businesses to cooperate with I. The second example I'm going to draw from a, comes from uh, RISI in Albania. So RISI Albania tried to simulate development of a um, sound commercial market for consultancy services in the agro-processing sector. So basically they wanted to ensure that consultancy services actually provide proper consulting and market assessment to agro-businesses, which would help them grow. At the same time, the idea was also to create an understanding among agro-businesses for the need to use certain consultancy services. But this intervention um, faced several obstacles. For one, um, consulting businesses did not consider 
agro-processors as viable clients. For them, their main clients are donors. Similarly, agro-processors were often not willing to pay consultancy and services, precisely because they could always find donors who would be willing to cover the cost. Now, this sort of puts certain limitations on, on to our work and uh, the sustainability of our interventions. Next. The task is, therefore, how can projects ensure that available, available donor funding contributes to long-term sustainable changes in the market system? So how can we tap into and leverage available donor resources without losing sight of sustainability? In the next slide, I'm going to uh, describe three main strategies that Helvetas has adopted in the Western Balkans. So the first strategy is to influence how project partners make use of available donor money, so ensuring that they engage um, with donors in a way that doesn't threaten their long-term sustainability. The second strategy is to influence donor spending behavior, so shape how donors make use of their funds. And the third strategy is to find a niche area to intervene in. So choosing an area that has not really caught the attention of other donors just yet and is sort of somewhat unspoiled, so to speak. So in the next slide, I'm briefly going to talk about Mark Maker's experience in the ICT sector here in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So Mark Maker actually facilitated the establishment of Big Alliance, which is an IT industry association. And um, Mark Amaskis was actually the first sort of donor project to become engaged with, with the Alliance. And uh, the project was therefore able to help the association to com come up with a sustainable financing model based on membership fees. In doing so, uh, the project hoped to reduce the risk of the, of the association becoming donor dependent. And secondly, um, the project took also a very strong role in advising the newly established IT industry association how to make use of donor money. So it, it tried to help the association to differentiate between donor funds that it can use to further, further its goals, and when donor funds might increase its donor dependency and might threaten its long-term vision as well as sustainability. So for instance, the first planned activity of Bit Alliance was actually an IT boot camp, so an intensive training program. Now for the first cycle of this uh, boot camp, the association requires a significant investment as internal funding generated through the membership fees was not yet enough. So it basically requires seed capital, seed capital like any young enterprise or startup. And market makers then help the association in identifying and approaching donors who could provide the financial input to kick off the first cycle. So the association actually received donor funds to pay for upfront operating costs. But that was always tied with a clear understanding that this was only a temporary injection of cash until enough internal funding was generated. Now, um, in this example, it's important to point out that Martin Nakers took a fairly hands-on approach. So it actually became an associate member uh, of the association, which meant it, had, it could build that relationship whereby it could really advise the association on when to use donor funding without negatively impacting its mission or sustainability. Now, the next strategy in the next slide influences um, focuses on influencing donor spending. So here I am briefly going to talk about ICE experience in the ICT sector in Kosovo. So now one of the interventions that I is actually working on is the female in IT initiative at the American University of Kosovo, and which seeks to encourage women to participate in IT training. So now I knew that one of the major constraints limiting female participation in IT courses is the lack of financing options. So banks, for instance, are often not willing to loan money to women as they're considered high risk. Now the prime objective of the project was therefore to help its partner to find a sustainable financing model and ensuring that more financing opportunities are offered to aspiring female trainees. Now, again, it's important to point down that the project really became a strong advocate for the skills development sector, particularly relating to IT. In many ways, it became an advocate for the constraints limiting IT skills development. So, by, in doing that, it basically shared data, information, knowledge, 
it had gathered throughout its experience in working in IT skills development. And it was very open and transparent about its experiences in the sector. It thereby also fostered a very strong relationship with donors and other relevant stakeholders working in this particular sector. And it was also very proactive about nurturing that relationship by sharing information, including them in, them, them in events, participating in conferences, roundtable discussions, and so on. So when one of the donors was about to design a credit line to the Ministry of Economic Development, the project got engaged in this process. So I actually became part of a working group discussing how this credit line should be dispersed. And I, naturally, advocated for part of this money to be allocated to skills development. So the money would thereby address a critical constraint limiting female participation in IT courses. So again, here I really positioned itself very strongly vis-a-vis -vis the donor as well as other governments and established itself as a trusted partner and fostered this relationship continuously. Now, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the third and uh, final coping strategy, that is finding a niche area to intervene in. So here is the idea that you focus on an area of, uh, which is basically uncharted waters. So sectors or subsectors, sectors or subsectors who have not yet caught the attention of donors. And here is a, actually an example from Risi's Albani, uh, Albanian intervention in the business process outsourcing sector. So in Albania, the business process outsourcing sector is mainly associated with call centers and telemarketing. And while they actually employ quite a lot of people, um, jobs in call centers and telemarketing companies are usually considered fairly low value and not very lucrative. As such, the BPO sector as a whole has been largely shunned by donors as well as the Albanian government. Um, however, Reach Albania tries to, tries to promote the development of the BPO sector through a newly established BPO association. And this BPO association actually tries to create a higher value added BPO sector. So focusing on BPOs, uh, things like accounting, HR, or finance, it really has the potential to create high quality jobs for youth in the country. So exactly because no one has worked on this before, the association is purely private sector driven and really has no experience in engaging with donors or in fact have received any donor uh, funding. So now this strategy naturally also bears certain risks and uncertainties. For one, it requires creativity. So the project has to be innovative and sees opportunities as they present themselves. And this in many ways is critical to any MSC project. Um, we have to take risk at hand, uh, we have to be creative, and we have to seize opportunities. Um, at the same time, and this has actually been pointed out by one of the participants uh, prior to the, to the webinar, um, the absence of donor presence itself cannot be the underlying factor why a project should go for a niche area. It should be rather relevant opportunities and feasibility which determine whether to get involved in the sector or not. And now in these examples, we were all met. The fact that no other donor was currently working in the sector was basically an added bonus, but not the decisive factor. Um, similarly, if a niche area with high growth potential, for instance, is identified, chances are that others will be jumping on the bandwagon. And this then leads us back to strategy A and B, so working with your partner to make sure that an influx of donor money won't threaten its sustainability or influence how donors spend their money. So strategy C, in other words, cannot work in isolation. It needs to happen in combination with A and or B. So next, what does this, what does this all mean? We have discussed three co coping strategies to deal with donor intensive content. Considering the extent of how strongly donor presence impacts our work, maybe it's time to start thinking about donors in a slightly more nuanced way. And in the next slide, I'm actually building on what Rubaiyat has already mentioned. Maybe it's time for us to start um, considering donors as market actors. As Rubaiyat has mentioned, market systems are not just composed of private actors. They're multiplayer and multifunctional. 
For instance, in the context of the Western Balkans, um, donor presence is not going to diminish anytime soon, especially now that many of the countries are on the EU accession path. Many donors have, in fact, increased their presence and commitment to the region. And um, secondly, if we do start treating donors as market actors, it might be therefore be helpful to get a better understanding of their incentives, interests, and capacities and include them in our market analysis. Now, this leads me to the third point, and also something that Rubaiyat has already spoken a little bit about. So, by developing a better understanding of their interests, incentives, and capacities, we can thereby also develop strategies to engage with them more meaningfully. We can find ways to make donors include donors in our work, so whether it's in the design phase or have a um, implementing strategy with regards to donors. So this is just some food for thought from our side and where we should where we might want to launch the discussion. So from this is all from my side from the moment and I'm very keen to hear about your experiences in finding coping strategies. So I'll pass it over to Shanila for now. Right. Thank you, Natalie. Good evening, everyone. So up until now, it was interesting to hear from Rubayat and uh, Natalie about what program implementers and private sector actors face on the ground. I will now take the discussion to the other end of the spectrum and hopefully try and explain how competing priorities are reconciled at the level of development partners using my experience in UK's Department for International Development. Firstly, I should point out that my views in this session are more from a country office perspective than from DFID centrally, and that is what the specific examples I will cite are focused around. I'll start by highlighting that support for market-based approaches is very high at present in DFID and exists at the highest level, both in the election manifesto and the recently published UK strategy. The UK government and DFID ministers have emphasized in very clear terms how sustained exit out of poverty and the importance of building institutions and systems to address the root causes of poverty pan out in our work. Hence, our work with the private sector has gained legitimacy and importance in a way that is radically different from, let's say, a decade ago. Because of this prioritization at the highest level, two things have happened. Within the growth and private sector team, we have really upped our game. And in Bangladesh, we have worked to mainstream the market systems approach across all our work so that instead of having one or two standalone market programs, all our second and third generation PSD programs take that wider and holistic view, whether it's in skills or financial sector or in very sector specific work such as in garments and agriculture. Secondly, issues around sustainability, exit strategy, value for money options and role of private sector have become a fundamental part of our vocabulary and the metrics through which new work is assessed. Hence, it has been much easier to engage with colleagues from other cadres and embed market-based approaches in other programs. For example, our new extreme poverty program will now have a very strong markets element as a core and central component based on the successful experience from a recent PSD program, which showed that with a little bit of effort, segments of the ultra-poor can be sustainably linked to market chains. And in other areas where the office consciously is using both market-based and subsidy-driven instruments, we have a much tighter narrative on why that is the case and what the intended outcome is. A good example uh, I'd like to highlight is the skills development space, which is, um, which is getting crowded in Bangladesh, and where as an office we have agreed to continue a combination of approaches to achieve the twin objectives of both changing the way the market currently works and ensuring that the poorest can benefit. However, on this journey of winning over hearts and minds, both internally in DFID and more widely in other donor organizations, I think there are a few very practical challenges involved. The first challenge is on the, is on the availability of clear and rigorous evidence on what works. So having clear success stories and impact being able to draw a distinction between what would have happened anyway, and being able to capture complicated issues such as crowding in into a log frame and link it to milestone-based contracts are all practical issues that we face in a programmatic context. The other reality is that it may get progressively more and more difficult to collect that evidence as programs mature and we go after deeper and complex issues with 
um, market systems, approaches, and instruments. Related to this issue is something that Rubai mentioned, which is around aligning incentives on short-term spend and results across organizations. Each donor organization has priorities that it has to deliver on, especially in an environment where aid is scrutinized very carefully. And instead of having to chase big numbers, that is, having the patience to see through long-term fundamental changes, and encouraging an organizational culture that fosters the creativity and risk-taking that Natalie highlighted are sometimes difficult to achieve. The third issue is really about striking a fair balance between market systems approach and the leave no one behind agenda, which DFID um, strongly prioritizes. We know that markets will not be able to solve problems for everyone within a reasonable time period, and that re definition of what is reasonable does vary. Hence, in critical areas, the cost recovery model may not always be the most appropriate, and we need to have a balanced view on what combination of approaches to cater to the various groups of people we care about makes sense in the context that we all work in. However, despite these challenges, I think a lot of progress has been done, especially in the last five years. I think joint programming with other donors is a very effective way to take this approach forward and learn lessons together. There are several examples whereby other donors using other methods have come, come on board with us in recent years. For example, Denmark, which also has other programming in agriculture, primarily in the public sector, joined the third phase of Catalyst alongside ourselves in Switzerland to see how effective this approach can be. We had Switzerland join us in a market-based skills program alongside other work that they do. We are currently in discussion with the Asian Development Bank to see whether we can collaborate together in a challenge fund in the financial sector, which would try and spark catalytic change. Some of these discussions do take a long time to materialize, but are definitely a worthwhile investment and often leads, often needs leadership role um, and um, quite a lot of uh, effort from our side. However, emphasizing the value of the market's approach undertaking deeper analysis and taking our aspirations forward are very, very important. Happy to take questions on any of these issues. Over to you, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks so much. That, that, that was really great to hear. Um, it was great to get um, kind of the extra perspective that you could bring then also to get a sense of where things are going both within DFID and, and within Bangladesh. So we have about 20 or 25 minutes to take any questions or comments. So some of you have started sending them in, but please, please keep on bringing those, those in, particularly those that address uh, the what's next. And if you have some ideas, you can give me a question slash comment. And um, to give you a few minutes to do that, we will start off by asking the presenters a couple questions we received in advance of the, of the webinar when, when essentially people were signing up. I think we have three of those, or two of those actually. So first of all, Sigrid Measure at Swiss Contact asks, are there examples of strategies of how to con convince other projects with a more assistential, i.e. not systemic approach to change their way of intervention. Um, I mean, that, I, like, I really like that question. I think that brings out this kind of a strategy of, of advocacy with other programs. And so it'd be great to maybe first of all get Natalie's view on how you can kind of advocate with other implementers or other, other organizations. Um, but also I, I, it'd be good to see perhaps at the donor side is there, you know, if, how perhaps you know, you're going out and you're advocating for the approach and if there's a role for Beeman, perhaps, in this, or, or other knowledge platforms. Uh, Natalie? Yes, thank you very much, Ashley. Yeah, it's actually a really good um, question from New Secret. So one of the things, the second strategy that I sort of described is when um, I took a very, very sort of a big role in advocating what, on the, the constraints of the skills development sector and sharing its insights and experience with others, I think that might be one strategy. But overall, I haven't really spoken about, as you might have noticed, about overhauling an entire modus operandi of a project. But um, we, we just have the Swiss intercooperation, we still do something which I think is very unique. So for instance, we actually hold regular MSC, MSC training sessions about twice a year in the region. And now these trainings are not just targeted at our own staff or people have just uh, joined our project, but we invite other projects with whom we might interact and stakeholders that our project across the Western Balkans work with. So for instance, here in Bosnia, Market Maker is actually part of a SCC funded youth portfolio. So while we focus on private sector growth, there are two other projects who work on job intermediation 
and skills development respectively. But they do not use an MC approach. So to get, but to get them to think more along the MC lines, we invite them to our trainings. Similarly, we invite government folks from ministries and as well as SC staff, SCC staff to our trainings. And then in Bosnia here with market makers, we actually have a quite a peculiar setup. And um, so we actually work together with regional development agencies who are our co-facilitators. The regional development agencies are basically implementers of various um, um, economic development projects. And they usually do not use an MSC approach. But a part of our mandate is actually to build their capacity in applying an MSC approach. And thereby we can uh, disseminate the MSC approach much more widely and well beyond the scope of our project. So neither of those pro um, approaches are necessarily quick fix fixes, but we do find them quite helpful. I hope that answered your question somewhat. Thanks very much. Would anyone like to add something to that, Shanila or Rabaif, or should we go to the next question? Sure, I'll add a bit. Um, as I said, I think it's part of a long journey. Um, however, what works uh, in terms of advocacy, I think, is being able to cite very clear examples of uh, where things have gone well and uh, where it has resulted in uh, real impact and being able to show that it's just not a sector-specific approach, but that application could cover a wide range of topics. Um, as, as Natalie said, some of it uh, needs quite a bit of work, but I think being able to bring others along on this path, whether, whether it's the government or multilateral organizations, so that it's, it's a wider body of uh, people who believe in this and are able to take that discussion forward. Thanks. Thanks very much. A question that was brought up by Kevin Billing who asks, M4P projects have biggest problems from donor distortion created by competition for clients because of the rule of only facilitating any way around it. And I think, Rabai, if you've been in further contact with Kevin, and I think what he's bringing up here is, is the challenge of, facilit of going out to a business and, and trying to offer them something when other people are showing more light touch, when others are giving them quite large amounts of assistance. And uh, I know Natalie touched on this, but could you, could you have a Rabai, could you add something to this, or could, or could anyone add something here? Yeah, I will, I will take that question. So thank you, for Kevin, for, for raising that question. And I think in my presentation, I did highlight that. So we are talking about context one in my presentation, where I was talking about um, facilitators facing competition from other competing donor approaches. Now, in that kind of a situation, um, uh, just a facilitation approach might not work. And the first question that we need to ask is why there are so many donors who are not taking the facilitation approach. And there must be a reason for that. And, um, and in many cases, what I figured out is that that happens when you're really going to the deep of the pockets where you're trying to figure out how to reach out the outer poor, which are, who are often not uh, I mean, engaged in market systems. You face that kind of a challenge. You face that kind of a challenge in health market systems. You face that kind of a challenge in wash market systems. And uh, increasingly, what I figured out is that the projects which kind of takes a, a, I mean, take a long-term view, whereby they start by finding out, okay, at this point in time, what we should be doing. Uh, and in that case, they find a space of having more than a light touch facilitation approach, whereby some kind of direct hands-on approach could work, what, what Natalie was presenting in her presentation as well. And then as they move along the line, they graduate through the pathway, as I presented, and then they take up more market-driven approach, um, I mean, at the end of the project. So that should work. I think, I mean, it's not about finding out, I mean, um, what would I say, just push facilitation right away without asking why it's not working in the first instance and whether it would work in the first instance. Thanks very much. I'm going to ask if any of our panelists, uh, other panelists, would like to add something to that. But while, Rupai, you, I, I want to jump to another question uh, that is very, because you, you, you brought up working in the other sectors. I know you have worked in, in numerous other sectors. So Chris Masala, sorry, Masilla asks, some sectors have more aid-intensive content, like the health sector, in developing countries. Any good examples of coping strategies in this sector? So I know, I know you've been working uh, in the health sector and also at the same time, I'm sure Chris has a lot to share about. I've seen what, what's come out of PSP for eight. There's a lot of great knowledge here, Chris. Uh, but Rabai, any, any thoughts about other sectors? 
Yeah, I can bring, bring in two examples. Um, one in the case of malaria control support that we're doing in Nigeria. So um, there, for one commodity, which is Artemis Nin Combination Therapy, um, there is this very big uh, global fund project on subsidizing Artemis Nin Combination Therapy. But that was um, kind of at the time bound, three years when we started with our intervention. But because of the subsidy, which was kind of all pervasive, it was, I mean, there was no way to work, uh, to not to coordinate with that intervention. So what we did, uh, instead of um, having parallel intervention to that, we piggybacked on that intervention. We basically partnered with um, pharmaceutical companies which were under that support, uh, which were already receiving the subsidy, but then uh, we tried to figure out what the subsidy was not being able to achieve. And the findings suggested that it was still not being able to address how the private sector could take this commodity to deeper rural markets. So uh, we did not focus on the subsidy. We knew that it was time bound. But what we then tried to figure out was that within this lifespan, like three years that we had, could we support the private sector to innovate the systems in a way that the commodities start to roll out to the rural markets as well, where it was not reaching out. And now what we figure out is, I mean, our results suggest that um, increasingly the private sector whom we work with is getting to those markets and in cases, they are also supplying the non-subsidized commodities as well to those markets. So uh, it kind of suggests how we can build on the other donor funded initiatives as well. Um, and also, if I'm not taking too much time, I just wanted to reflect on a recent experience in wash sector in Bangladesh, um, where we were trying to find out um, um, what's happening with regards to private sector engagement. What was peculiar uh, to our finding was that um, most of the private sector engagement that was being done here in Bangladesh, uh, they were targeting institutional buyers in the short run, not really the commercial market or the retail market. So big scale procurement from NGOs and from government agencies was basically holding the intervention. Then the question was whether this could sustain in the long run. And we looked back at the evidence base what that we had in our hand. And, and the evidence suggested that in fact, in a lot of the cases of innovations that happened in 90s in WAS sector in Bangladesh, this was the same case that the procurement from public sector played a big role, from the NGOs played a big role. And in 10 or 15 years of time, eventually when the procurement succeeded, um, the commercial market for those commodities This is where I guess we're talking about a find, I mean, finding a balance between what we call hands-out approach and also market facilitation approach, You're looking at a much longer term impact on market systems change. Um, thanks for that, Rabai. Um, I think we might just be having a, an issue with uh, Ashley's sound. If you can just bear with us for one moment. Sorry, if you might just jump because I thought there was another there was another question about um, donors as market actors, and then maybe if you can just start that discussion quite um, as well. So why should basically what is the, why should we consider them as market actors? And I think from our perspective, what we've learned here is that by ex um, including them in our market, this, by accepting them as market actors, we can actually include them in our market analysis. And by expanding our market analysis, we can actually get a much more accurate as well as honest representation of what the market system actually looks like. To to officially exclude donors and I actually exclude a market analyst to a certain extent. So if I might just go back to the example I gave about um, we see in Albania in the agro-processing sector. So for instance, there the main constraint was um, 
but the growth potential of the agricultural sector was the lack of marketing services or consultancy services more generally. But now the fact that um, donor presidents have heavily influenced sort of informal rules regarding consultancy services, so that consultancy services are not considered um, by agribusinesses as as, um, as, as a viable solution, that consultancies do not consider agribusinesses as clients, so it really impacts sort of the informal rule, the bottom half of the donut. And I think if you really do then want to find and tackle this situation, then we have to include them in our market analysis. Otherwise, we might still stumble upon that, but just in a much later, much later on when we've already started our um, our pilot and have already raised the quite significant resources as well as time on a specific intervention. Hi, I want to come back. Uh, for, I think you can hear me now. So sorry about that. Uh, thanks very much for jumping in, Jack. And thanks for the question, Chris. So Natalie, as far as I, I think uh, you were talking about this question of, uh, if, if I'm wrong, please let me know about treating donors as, as market actors. And, but I think I, I wanted to bring in the question that we, we had on this. And if, if you just said this, I'm very sorry. But the question that came in, for, for, I'm trying to find right now, from Hans Posthumus, who asks, sorry, pardon me. I can't find that question immediately now. But Hans asked, I, I'm not sure, well, about this idea of considering donors as market actors, how do you factor in the short-term nature of projects? So you both have, you know, the, the donors are going to be there long term in the Balkans, but yet they're still working there, they're five years, less kind of projectization. So, so how do you factor that in? And I, I also I want to broaden up, up that question to, to Rabbi and Shanida, should we be seeing donors as, as market actors? And, and what might that mean differently for our programs? Um, thank you, Ashley. I think, I mean, when we say donors as market actors, that kind of sounds, um, I don't know, negative. But uh, what we're talking about here is that um, how the donors and their funds and the projects really influence the supply and demand of the product that we're talking about, and that is targeting the poor. So in, in, in cases that we have seen, um, the presence of the donor funding, the presence of a project really influences the demand and supply. And as Natalie was presenting, if we are not really mapping it out, how the presence of other funds is, is, um, 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 is basically influencing the demand and supply, we're not really able to design our intervention to facilitate the systems change in the long run. It's not about the, uh, I mean, when we're talking about sustainability, it's not about donor support being sustained. It's not about donor funding being sustained. It's about how the, at this point in time when we're intervening, how the presence of this donor money is, is influencing the demand and supply. And in the long run, what is their policy with regards to supporting or continuing the support for the initiative that we are taking and how we are positioning our intervention to respond to that so that the private sector or not-for-profit sector as the context may be applicable to can sustain the efforts that we are really supporting. Um, so that's how I look at that. Yeah, sort of to jump on um, what Ubayev has always said, so the distinction between long-term commitment and then relatively short-term projects, right? So as Ubayev has said, there's sort of like incorporating the long terms of interest and those intense incentives of a donor within a context. But I think generally as market systems develop on projects, we constantly revise our strategies. So there's new actors, there's new things happening. We have to adapt and I just see uh, even shorter term projects as an extension of that continuous updating of strategy and adjusting to to uh, to the system. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. And do we have any any other responses to to this idea of treating donors as as market actors, or perhaps in, well, any nuance to add to that? Okay, I think we're going to come back to that because I see we have a few more minutes and there's questions coming in. I see there's, no, there's not much time. Well, one question that came in from Dominic Conrad is, is I don't know if, uh, I'm going to mention this and see if anyone on the, on the panel can respond to this, but it might be the wrong place. Does the Paris Declaration and a partnership commitment about harmonization not provide a strong enough platform to harmonize the interventions of donors in a way not to undermine efforts of long-term change versus direct service projects? So he, he thinks 2016 could be another monitoring year of the Paris Declaration. Is this topic a focus of this year's evaluation? 
Um, I mean, we haven't kind of drifted into this 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 world around uh, more senior donor coordination. I don't know if anyone feels that they have something they can add here. Uh, Shanila, I'm looking at you a little bit, but if if, if you feel this isn't quite a question to answer, that, that's fine, of course. I'll, I'll um, uh, make a stab. I don't honestly think um, that the Paris Declaration and the commitments around that have been strong enough on the ground um, to get donors to align their work in a very practical level. Um, but then, you know, we have donor groups uh, at varying levels um, in Bangladesh, um, uh, you know, involving various levels at missions, etc. But I think honestly, where donor work has been most aligned, you know, broadly beyond uh, private sector work, is in areas where the host government or the recipient association or private sector bodies were clear in articulating what it is that they want to do and had a game plan on the kind of change that they wanted to see happen. So for example, I'll cite the example of how international organizations and development partners came together post Rana Plaza, the factory building that fell down a couple of years ago. Um, and efforts did come together on a very coherent and targeted basis because the government on the ground had a clear action plan on the kinds of things that it wanted to take forward. Other than that, um, I think we've tried, we, we are trying to do that um, in specific sectors such as in our work with the central bank, et cetera, uh, but with all varying levels of success because there isn't a clear um, plan on the ground to dock into. Thanks very much. I think that's, that's a great answer, but also flags up the kind of wider world we should be thinking about. I think we're going to have to end the questions there. I have seen great ones coming in. Thanks, Chloe, Sigrid, Abdurazad, Suresh, and Mafruk. And I assure you, we will send an email. We'll get back to you just time wise. But the last comment I'd like to end with is, is around donors as market actors. And it's from Patricia Camacho, who says that we should be visualizing the future market situation and sustainability with stakeholders, including other donors. And this is so important. In practice, there are local development workshops around a value chain where this, this would be possible. And it would be, I think Patricia is very involved with ASOCAM in, in, Central, um, in Central America. I, I, and great, this would be great to have a further conversation with you around this. And I think as well, the role of, of let's say, local networks in, in making this all happen. So, so thanks very much to everyone. I'm sorry to end it there on the questions. Um, well, we have a few minutes left, so what I wanted to do is share a final poll with yourself. So if you could bring that up, Jack. Um, the point of this, as I said, this is a first conversation, uh, but it's to think about where to go next. And you, you'll see the poll coming up. And the idea is, is, is where can Beam go next? Where can you go next? The speakers here, what's the general direction? And uh, if you could fill it up, you'll see there's a, uh, a bar chart as well in the, in the top right called polling. And uh, one is essentially is zero, five is, you know, let's really do this. And so the five questions we have there, and we'll end the survey probably when I finish talking, is should we be further assessing the problem and the underlying causes? Should we be sharing more program strategies and tactics? Should we further consider the implications of treating donors as market actors or further this line of inquiry? Um, should we focus on improving coordination between market systems programs? Um, also, should we, perhaps leaving aside the, the, the kind of facilitation and facilitation competition, should we produce advocacy materials to convince other approaches donors and then advocate? Should we be supporting in-country donor or practitioner coordination groups? And so all these, uh, please uh, try and spread out your ones and fives as much as you can. Um, last one is, I have something to say. If you want to share something, please write it in there, what you think are other next steps, your experiences. Um, and include your name, and perhaps we can get back to you if we feel we can take this further. Um, Jack, could you uh, maybe give us 10 seconds and then close the poll? Okay, so I'm kind of counting the 10 seconds down in my mind. And hopefully you can all see on the side. So this is us here, we, we won't be binding anyone, just to get, to get a sense of where we can go next. And, and if you include your name, we can see if we can get back to you if you have a particular idea. So Jack, is that possible to make to, to finish that? Okay. So we are getting pretty close to the to the end, and I can see the the the, the highest one is focusing on improving coordination 
between market systems programs. So perhaps on the ground around M and E attribution around local organization groups, there's a lot of value there. Um, but there seems to be support for all of those, and I think particularly the, the implications of treating donors as market actors, Natalie, was particularly interest as well, and could be a rich line of work. So, so thanks very much, everyone, for, for what, what you put there. Um, can I just put, uh, pass over to our speakers and ask if you have any final words or thoughts and next steps? Yeah, thank you, Ashley, for organizing this, and thank you to all the participants in today's uh, webinar. Um, I wanted to pick on uh, what Vashanita left. Um, I mean, she did mention a very good and important point for our attention, which is the reality. And all the donors have their priorities, and uh, they have to report um, um, their impact that is being achieved. And more often than not, there are balances that need to be made. And um, so the topic that we picked for today's discussion is very interesting and important for, for, for the future, I guess, for the kind of interventions that we undertake. But I, I also think that we need to bring our heads together to find out how to really contribute to that donor priority and, and ensure that we are not just uh, engaging on a theoretical debate whereby there is no end to it. So I would very much love to hear from everyone who has participated in today's webinar. So you have um, our email addresses, and that includes mine. So please drop us a line about your experience. And um, so uh, we'll be very much interested to collaborate with you on um, finding answers to these questions that we are dealing with here. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'm just sitting. I, I, I apologize, I couldn't answer to some of the questions. I think Hans also just a very good question. So please um, feel free to follow up in an email because I'm still typing away. But yeah, from our side, we'd be really keen to um, learn more about your coping strategy. And also sort of like by treating donors as market actors, if you already were, do something in that regard, how do you incorporate that into your work? Also to uh, move this conversation a little bit more forward. So I'd be really keen to get feedback from the participants on that subject as well. So many thanks to Mike as well. Yes, um, exactly. Similar sentiments from my side. Uh, I think it was a great discussion, a great first start. Uh, and more broadly, in a context where the overall aid architecture is changing and new instruments are being tested and um, more and more developing countries are maturing into transition economies, I think targeted and smarter aid makes just real sense for all parties involved but very important to keep these discussions going and hope to learn from future similar sessions. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we've also learned, thanks Chloe, we'll, we'll keep the poll open for longer next time. Um, so we're, we're, with that, I want to close the webinar. Thanks all for your, 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 your very active participation and great questions. We really hope you got some great ideas coming out of this. As there's so many questions, as I said, we couldn't answer them all, but we'll definitely get back to you here or, sorry, by email or by LinkedIn, so, so stay tuned. And again, of course, feel free to contact any of the presenters or myself with any questions, comments, and next steps you have in mind. Um, I'll be reviewing everything we said again and your questions and trying to think what next, next step team could actually consider. And I'll try to share around some comments on this in the next couple of weeks. Um, can I please ask that you to participate in another survey? This is our, our kind of evaluation of the webinar. We really use those to continue to improve our webinars. It will pop up when you leave the webinar, and, and we really do value any feedback there. Um, for those of you who want to know more about the topic, I would strongly recommend a great blog written by Helvetas Eastern Europe on working in donor-heavy environments. We are sharing the link now, or I believe we just have. Generally, I would recommend checking out the BEAM website where we have a great deal of resources more generally on market systems approaches. One thing that might be of interest is that we are encouraging people who have something exciting to share to let us know and we can help you set up your own webinar. These are grab the mic webinars, so let us know what you have to share. So um, I would like to say a massive thanks to uh, our three presenters for volunteering to introduce us to the topic and sharing their experiences with us. It really means a lot that you would do this and, and share so much. And that leaves me with nothing more than to say, I hope that you all enjoyed the event and we wish you a really great re rest of your day. Thanks very much. Goodbye. <laughs>